So we're going to talk about uh, transition metal alkyl complexes. And uh, these molecules are nothing uh, special. They're not very different from the main group metal compounds that we have discussed. The first thing that I want to mention is that uh, these molecules were synthesized fairly early almost uh, 150 years 170 years ago and um, uh, in this molecule for example PTME3I was synthesized almost uh, 120 years ago and uh, it was only in 1950 that there was a big upswing in the synthesis of other metallic compounds and their study if you look at the synthesis of uh, the PTME3I compound that I told you about, uh, that was uh, done in 1900s, uh, that was done using a simple transmetallation reaction using tetrachloroplatinum with four equivalents of the Grenade. That led to this molecule, which from molecular weight measurements was shown to be having this particular formulation and this formulation was characterized much later by X-ray crystallography and you have here the um, uh, you have here the structure of this molecule I have um, drawn for you this uh, structure and let me see if I can annotate it I will uh, annotated. This is um, uh, the structure that we have. Let's use a pen and choose a color. Okay. So um, this is the structure of the molecule that was uh, determined much later. Uh, Zeiss. Uh, who is also the discoverer of the famous Zeiss complex, which is an olefin complex, also found that you could make uh, a ryl chromium complex in 1957. So uh, these are compounds which were uh, organometallic in nature, but nevertheless did not receive significant amounts of uh, attention. Transition metal alkyls are still rare. Are they really unstable compounds? Are they thermodynamically unstable? Or is it because of some kinetic effect? One of the first reasons that was given uh, was uh, the reason that these elements are large that is the transition metals are much larger than carbon and so the bond that is formed by overlap of the d orbital with the carbon orbital is necessarily weak this weakness comes as a result of the diffuseness of d orbitals so let me remind you something about what i said regarding bond energies in the main group chemistry you have a fairly linear increase in the bond strength of carbon element bonds, carbon element bonds. The element is carbon, silicon, germanium, tin and lead. So the methyl tin bond, methyl germanium bond uh, if you look at the bond energies, you find that uh, there is a monotonic increase in the bond energies when it comes to transition metals. But when it comes to main group elements, there is usually a decrease. You find that uh, there is a slight uh, discontinuity in the case of this table, but in general, there is a steady change. Uh, from high energies for carbon-carbon bonds to low energies for carbon-lead bonds. 
the lead metal bond actually breaks when you supply sufficient energy which might even be room temperature inherently less stable carbon metal bonds or carbon element bonds may be because of the energy difference between the carbon orbital and the lower lead orbital but this uh, is just another way of saying that these two orbitals are not compatible in terms of combining and forming a bond interacting and forming a bonding molecular orbital now let me talk about the bond strengths in uh, the metal carbon bonds in transition metals i have taken one example but this is not very different from other elements if you take manganese the bond energies are reasonably high they are in fact as high as carbon other element bonds here i have carbon iodine mm, carbon iodine these two bond strengths are around 240 kJ per mole and uh, this is not very different from the manganese carbon bond which is found in these molecules so uh, this brings us to this puzzle why should the bond energies change uh, in the way in which they do they seem to be distinctly higher for lower uh, row transition elements that is the 3d row 4d row and the 5d row titanium is 3d zirconium is 4d hafnium is 5d so you find that there is a uh, increase in the bond energy in the case of transition metals when it comes to main group elements there is a monotonous decrease so one has to explain this bond energy difference now uh, in this figure actually you should um, talk about uh, you sh uh, you have to really um, discuss the rows carefully for example here you can consider uh, the titanium and the zirconium benzyl complexes the methyl and methyl manganese and methyl rhenium complexes and if you look at these two you find that as you go down the periodic table you have increased the bond energy if you look at the bond energies of a series of manganese compounds the carbon manganese bond is approximately similar to the hydrogen manganese bond and much better than the manganese manganese bond and here uh, you look at the manganese carbon bond in a benzylic molecule this is significantly lower significantly lower uh, so the prepared using standard transmetallation reactions in the first one uh, using a grignard reagent the grignard reagent is used to prepare the um, zirconium compound that is uh, a benzyl tetrabenzyl zirconium a straight forward reaction in the second reaction uh, a transmetallation has been done with uh, titanium using an aluminum compound aluminum is more electropositive and titanium is more electronegative so you transfer the alkyl group from the electropositive element to the electronegative element and what you have is a uh, methyl titanium compound which is reasonably stable the benzylic compound that is pictured here is also reasonably stable now 
uh, if you look at the tetramethyl compound, that tetramethyl compound decomposes uh, at very low temperatures, even at minus 50 degrees centigrade, it is not very stable. Uh, this is uh, not very stable even at minus 50 degrees centigrade, whereas TaCl4 can be distilled. It doesn't decompose until its boiling point. In fact, it can be purified by distillation. Uh, WME6, on the other hand, was made in 1980 uh, by Wilkinson, but it is unstable and decomposes at room temperature, uh, much below room temperature, minus 40, it decomposes. But at minus 100, it can be crystallized and uh, the crystals are fairly plastic, which means they are soft, but they can be uh, studied at minus 105 degrees using crystallography. So uh, this is not um, a bad deal. But so our initial thought that there are weak transition metal bonds is probably wrong and we have to revise that idea. If you look at all these uh, molecules, the metal atom has a deficiency in the electron count. So maybe, maybe there is a problem in terms of the electron count and if you take care of the electron deficiency it would be stable and one way to protect the element which is electron deficient is to have sterically bulky ligand and this is one method that is often found to be suitable for stabilizing metal alkyl compounds um, here are two examples. So in this slide, uh, what we have is a molecule that seems to be uh, reasonably stable. And uh, uh, this stability is taken care of by the presence of the chloride ligand, which can pump in electron density into the titanium which can pump an electron density into the titanium using the extra lone pairs that are present on the chlorine. So maybe electron deficiency is the key. But if you look at the corresponding ethyl compound, that compound is not stable. Um, so one more clue comes from the fact that if you take ring systems, these ring systems are reasonably stable. Um, adamantyl is a sterically very large group. So four adamantyls around chromium seems to make this chromium compound reasonably stable. Norbonyl is also reasonably stable. And the niobium compound has got uh, four norbonyl units. But look at this platinum compound. The platinum compound has got only a cyclobutyl group attached to it, but in spite of that, it is reasonably stable. So this gives us a clue that maybe there is something else in addition to the electron deficiency that is uh, the cause for the instability of these molecules. One last slide, and this is uh, the example of transition metal carbons with these alkyl groups. These alkyl groups which are pictured here uh, are all stable. One of them has got a CF3 group in the beta position. Another one has got a tertiary butyl group in the uh, beta position. A third one has got a benzyl group in the beta position and the uh, fourth one doesn't have a benzene and a beta position at all. There is only a methyl group which is present in this molecule. So one way in which maybe the stability of the compound 
is destroyed is by having a beta hydrogen. So in the previous slide I told you that the ethyl compound is unstable, the methyl is stable. So the ethyl has got a beta hydrogen. So this seems to indicate that to avoid decomposition you should not have beta hydrogens. You should not have beta hydrogens if you want to keep the compound stable at room temperature. So this suggests that there are kinetic factors. There are kinetic factors which are resulting in the instability of the molecule and um, uh, the instability comes about by the presence of a beta hydrogen. The instability is probably also related to the electron deficiency in the transition metal. In many cases, the decomposition product is an alkene. The decomposition product is an alkene and a metal hydride is isolated. So combined with the fact that the stable compounds do not have a beta hydrogen and the fact that decomposition is an alkene, more clue comes from the fact that there are unusual bond angles and um, uh, these have been confirmed by X-ray crystallographic studies. Here is one example where you have a titanium ethyl compound which is stabilized no doubt by the presence of uh, the by the presence of the chlorine, the chlorine takes care of the electron deficiency which is present in the metal. So the presence of the chlorine is taking care of the electron deficiency. But still, the looking at the beta hydrogen, this is the alpha and uh, this is the beta. So this is the beta hydrogen you find that the beta hydrogen uh, has got a strange bond distance or a bond angle um, at the carbon which suggests that the metal is able to interact with the beta hydrogen in some fashion. This was first pointed out by MLH Green and Brookhart. Uh, Brookhart was a student at that time probably and MLH Green was a uh, a uh, faculty member at Oxford who um, discovered that the electron deficiency and the presence of these unusual bond angles go together. So if you look at the uh, bond angle that you expect at the carbon in the titanium methyl complex, it has to be 109 degrees. And surprisingly you find that uh, angles are not 109 degrees, they deviate from 109 and in addition uh, this bond distance between the titanium and the hydrogen is reasonably short, is reasonably short. So look at this um, bond distance that you have between titanium and hydrogen. This is hardly 2.29 angstroms and this is shorter than the sum of the covalent radii for hydrogen and covalent radii for titanium. So this is clear indication that there is some kind of a stabilizing interaction between the titanium and the hydrogen. So there have been many studies. Uh, they usually come up with unusual bond angles, unusual coupling constants uh, in NMR spectroscopy and uh, interestingly, there is no eye infrared evidence to suggest that there is any interaction between the metal and the hydrogen, but this is not very surprising because infrared spectroscopy uh, works at a very uh, fast time scale. Basically, the vibration requires hardly femtoseconds and so uh, it is not surprising that uh, they are not detected in the infrared spectroscopy uh, because these uh, bond, uh, bonds might be fluctuating and fluxional in character. 
So uh, here I will uh, I have uploaded for you two PDF files uh, which you can click on these links in the uh, in this presentation and see the type of interactions that are present sometimes between alpha hydrogens and the metal and sometimes between beta hydrogens and the metal. So in some instances alpha hydrogens have also um, been shown to interact with the metal. So both of these structures some of them are shown in the PDF file that are uploaded for you. And these interactions were called acoustic interactions by MLH Green. Uh, MLH Green was the person who first called it uh, acoustic interaction. So this was again uh, uh, called acoustic by MLH Green. And this acoustic interaction is associated with deficiency in electron count. There has to be CH bonds as electron donors and uh, they can be with alpha carbon or the beta carbon, alpha hydrogen or beta hydrogen. Both of them can form agostic interactions. In support of the fact that this is associated with electron density or electron deficiency on the transition metal is a fact that if you have a benzylic system, the tetrabenzyl compound that we discussed earlier, that has got an interaction between the pi bond which is present in the alpha position. Um, this is, sorry, the beta position. So this pi bond in the beta position is interacting with the titanium. So this is one reason why this molecule is stable. So earlier we were talking about the benzylic compound which was stable, it doesn't have a beta hydrogen. Not only that, it has got a stabilizing beta double bond which stabilizes it. If the molecule has got an alkoxy group, that also leads to stability because the oxygen has got a pair of electrons which can be donated from the uh, oxygen, electron density can flow to the titanium. So a halogen or an oxygen in the coordination sphere will lead to uh, a system which is not terribly electron deficient and so it will not decompose. So I would like to mention that not all of the short contacts are agostic interactions. There are some interactions where the metal is actually electron rich and it still interacts with the hydrogen. These interactions, like the one that is pictured on the right hand side of the slide, they are called anagostic interactions. They are more like hydrogen bonds. So in other words, the hydrogen is delta plus. It's a, a partial charge, positive partial charge on the hydrogen and the metal is negatively charged and it has an electrostatic interaction between the metal and the hydrogen. So these interactions surprisingly are much, much, much weaker in terms of the bond distances. The bond distances are longer. So they're easy to recognize that they, although they fall within the short contacts, they are not really as short as the agostic interactions. In the agostic interactions, there is a clear electron deficiency in the metal. The metal is interacting with the two electrons which are present in the CH bond. So the two electrons on the CH bond, bonding orbital, are donated to the empty orbital on the metal. That's like a three center two electron interaction and that's the best description of the agostic interaction. The anagostic interaction which is pictured on the right has also got another difference and that difference is the MHC angle. The MHC angle is significantly larger close to 170 degrees for the anagostic interaction whereas in the case of agostic interaction the metal is interacting with the CH bond itself and so that angle is more acute. 
it is closer to 90 degrees and a last difference that one can point out is the fact that you can detect such interactions by looking at the NMR chemical shift if you look at the hydrogen that is interacting with the metal in the agostic sense then the delta H of the interacting hydrogen is upfield compared to another hydrogen which is on the adjacent carbon that is if the carbon which has two hydrogens one of them is interacting with the metal another one is free then compared to the free hydrogen the one that is interacting with the metal is upfield shifted whereas when it is anacostic it is downfield shifted that is because it has got a greater amount of electron density now from the metal so anagostic interaction and agostic interactions can be clearly distinguished by just counting electrons on the metal and looking at the angle between the MHC. Uh, that angle is a giveaway. It tells you whether it is agostic or anagostic. So this helps to distinguish between the two types of interactions. This was also pointed out in the Brookhart paper which is published in 2007. If you look at the publications that have come out from agostic interactions, there seems to be a very large number and there seems to be no decrease. This uh, publication came out in 2007 and it has listed all the publications that mention the word agostic and it is uh, not surprising. <coughs> that you have a large number of publications which are mentioning agostic interactions. This is probably a landmark paper where amazingly Brookhart, uh, if you remember Brookhart and MLH Green were the first people to report the agostic interaction and in this discovery in 2007 they have reported an amazing structure where they have shown that the alkyl complex is probably a higher energy form of a more stable system where the stable system has got a beta hydrogen interacting with the metal. So you should do the electron count for all these molecules and check this for yourself that the cobalt does in fact have an electron deficiency and um, if it does then uh, it is natural that it interacts with the CH bond in the beta position as it is interacting in the center structure. On the extreme left of this slide, what you find is the other, ex other stable form of this metal complex. You will find that this is in fact a cobalt 3 complex and if you count the electrons, you find that there are six electrons from the cyclopentadienyl system, six electrons from the ligands in the bottom. So six plus six, 12. And cobalt, if it is three plus in this complex, then it is an 18 electron system. Whereas if you take the extreme right structure, what you find is again, it is a 16 electron system now because it is a cobalt 3 plus complex and you have a total of uh, 4 plus 6, 10, 10 plus 6, 16 electrons, 6 coming from the cobalt. So uh, 6 coming from the cyclopentadienyl unit, 2 electrons coming from the olefin, 2 electrons coming from the alkyl group. So totally 4 electrons from the ligands in the bottom and six electrons coming from the cyclopentadienyl, so 10 electrons plus cobalt can give three electrons because it is a cobalt three plus system. So totally you have 16 electrons and you find that the 16 electron system is clearly less stable. Although by computation, it has been shown that this 16 electron system is less stable than the 18 electron system. Now, what is interesting is that although this system is stable, uh, computationally, what has been shown is that the ground state 
happens to be the one where there is a beta hydrogen interacting with the cobalt. So this would also have an 18 valence electron count. If you count the two electrons from the CH bond are being donated to the metal. Two electrons which are being uh, donated from the CH bond into the metal. Uh, to just to recap, here is the increasing bond strength as you go down the group. Titanium is 260, zirconium is 330. Manganese carbon bond is 150 kilojoules per mole. Rhenium carbon bond is 220 kilojoules per mole. Uh, this is graphically represented here with um, two sets of compounds, titanium, zirconium and uh, Hafnium are always increasing, whereas the main group elements of the fourth group, fourth uh, group, are really coming down in energy as you go down. Carbon, silicon, germanium, tang, tin, and lead. So this trend has not been explained. Now, uh, just for your uh, just so that you understand this is a general phenomenon i have given for you several different uh, lists here this is um, the carbon metal bond going down in energy as you go down to lead metal bond and here i have two sets titanium zirconium hafnium where the bond energy is consistently increasing and um, uh, you also have another set of uh, uh, bond energies which indicate that as you go down lower in the group, you can have strong bonds. So uh, here of course I have compared the main group elements and the transition elements in a single slide. and. Uh, you can see that the main group elements of bond energy is uh, decreasing and then the transition elements it is increasing. So, uh, so one of the reasons that was given was that the bond energy becomes less with main group elements because it is the size of the element becomes bigger. Maybe in transition elements it's not becoming bigger. So let's look at transition elements. Here I have titanium zirconium. The size of titanium is 1.32, zirconium is 1.45. Clearly zirconium is larger than titanium. Yet the bond energy is in fact increasing. So if you remember the covalent radius of carbon is only 0.7 angstroms. Um, the covalent radius of carbon is 0.7. So you can see that the overlap would clearly be poorer with zirconium. If you look at manganese and rhenium, the same situation is there. Manganese is 1.17 and rhenium is 1.28. Still, in spite of that, the bond energy has increased. So if you increase the size, it doesn't necessarily mean that the bond energy goes down. So if you look at boron and aluminum, 
you have 0.82 and aluminum is 1.18 but in spite of that boron bond energy is much higher than aluminum and similarly boron oxygen and aluminum oxygen you can see that these two are reasonably similar but they are, it is slightly lower aluminum oxygen is slightly lower so very clearly the size of the element is not correlating with the strength of the bond when you have the same group zinc dimethyl and cadmium dimethyl it's a main group element so 1.25 and 1.48 cadmium is clearly bigger than zinc in spite of that the bond energy if you look at the bond energy it is decreasing so main group elements which are pictured here main group elements which are pictured here on the lower half of the screen the bond energy is always decreasing as you go down the group in the transition metals the bond energy is always increasing so the coal and radius of the metal cannot be a good reason for the change in the the trend in the bond energies uh, maybe it is the electronegativity trends so if you look at electronegativity trends uh, i have that listed in red in this slide you find the titanium and zirconium is 1.15 and 1.14 it is decreasing titanium to zirconium it is decreasing uh, and the bond energy is increasing whereas if you look at manganese and rhenium surprisingly the electronegativity trend is uh, slightly increasing in the case of rhenium and the bond energy is also increasing so there is no relationship between bond energy and electronegativity values if you look at boron and aluminum the electronegativity value is 2.0 and 1.5 clearly the electronegativity has gone down as you go down the group uh, bond energy is also gone down uh, if i look at uh, zinc and cadmium 1.6 and 1.7 here the electronegativity has slightly gone up for cadmium and what you find is that the bond energy has gone down so the bond energy and the electronegativity do not seem to correlate or have a proper clear relationship or at least you can say that no conclusion can be arrived at by looking at electronegativity trends so let us conclude this section on metal alkyls transition metal alkyls uh, are quite stable they are not so unusual and many of them can be made by a simple transmetallation reaction although other general methods can work transmetallation is a ideal way of generating transition metal alkyls many of the transition metal alkyls have got no anionic character on the carbon the metal carbon bonds seem to be more covalent and if you look at the bond strength variation in transition metal alkyls and in main group metal alkyls there seems to be a big difference we have not fully explained this in this talk but we will encounter that again a little later now the kinetic instability of transition metal alkyls which we encountered in the beginning which seem to indicate that they are rare species is primarily due to what is called an agostic interaction and it comes from the acute electron deficiency on the metal so that electron deficient metal interacts with the ch bond and the interaction the donation of the ch bond electron density into the vacant metal orbital leads to a stabilization which is called agostic interaction the electron deficiency in metal alkyls can either lead to a three center two electron bonding or it can also lead to a four center two electron bond that is a mistake there so it can also lead to a four center two electron bond that type of interaction is fairly rare 
but three center two electron bonds are very common. So with this we conclude the section on transition metal alkyls. We will talk about another section where we discuss unusual metal alkyls.